very much for joining us uh, for this hybrid event uh, titled Rethinking Resilience, Men and Conflict Trauma in Ukraine. Uh, my name is Meta Basilov Jensen. I'm the Deputy Director of the Cross-Border Conflict Evidence Policy and Trends Research Program, also known as ACCEPT. Um, before we kick off today's discussion, uh, I'm going to give you just a quick bit of background on the program and also some housekeeping. First, on the housekeeping, um, first, please note this uh, event is being recorded uh, and the recording will be made publicly available afterwards. So, you know, don't say anything you don't want on the record. Um, secondly, we're not expecting a fire drill. Um, so for those of you in the room, if you do hear the alarm, um, please head for the emergency exit. So there's a door there with a green sign and also um, all the way back on that side. Um, importantly, bathrooms are just around the corner here. Please just follow the signs. Um, and finally, this is a truly hybrid um, event. We're trying to engage both people here in the room um, and online, and we have speakers also joining us um, online. We do have some great IT support um, to ensure that this all runs smoothly, um, but should there be a hiccup along the way, I hope you will bear with us. Um, a lot of effort has gone into ensuring there won't be any hiccups, but I, I'm sure you've all been on Teams calls and the and the like that has dropped nonetheless. Um, now, a super quick introduction to the Accept program. Um, we're a multi-year research program funded by UK International Aid or UK International Development, as it now is called. Um, our research examines borderlands and the transnational cross-border dimensions um, of conflict, as well as the drivers of violent and peaceful um, behaviors. All of that with a view to generating recommendations for better policy responses or more effective policy responses. Um, we encourage research that um, applies a pretty diverse mix of methodologies, including sort of innovative methodologies such as um, satellite data and open source investigations. Um, and across our many partners, we cover conflicts uh, across the Middle East and North Africa, the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, and also parts of South and Southeast Asia. Um, please do check out our website uh, or get in touch with us directly to learn more. We love to talk about except. Um, today's discussion builds on some of the exciting research by our partners at um, Keeks College London. Their interdisciplinary team bring together experts on a really wide variety um, of uh, areas. We have trauma, memory, cognitive science, history, gender, terrorism, psychology, um, and fields sort of well beyond. Um, and they bring all of that together to better understand the behavioral dimensions um, of uh, conflict and peace. Um, and they look at whether it's armed actors, prisoners or extremists or civilians or even victims. Um, the Kill King's College team asks why people resort to violence or turn away from it. Um, looking at the effects of trauma uh, is a really important element of that, that quite a bit of effort goes into uh, looking at a King's and this is also where we'll zoom in today. Um, and to moderate that discussion, we're extremely privileged um, to have with us Professor Martin Bricknell, who is a professor of conflict, health and military medicine at King's College London. Um, prior to taking up this role, uh, Martin served 34 years. He doesn't look it, but he served 34 years in the UK Defence Medical Services. Um, culminating in the senior leadership appointment of Surgeon um, Surgeon General. I will hand over to Martin to introduce both today's discussion and our esteemed uh, panelists. So Martin, over to you and welcome everyone. Thank you, Mette. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, this evening to moderate our discussion on rethinking resilience, men and conflict trauma in Ukraine. This is part of a two part series by Accept which will explore what research tells us about the impacts of war in Ukraine for people and society, as well as lessons for future recovery. We are here today as tragically this month marks the second anniversary of Russia's extension of its invasion in Ukraine that started in 2014. War has terrible consequences for both the health and health services of affected populations. 
clearly there is the immediate consequence of physical trauma causing death and injury. We also have seen how war destroys health infrastructure, uh, upsets uh, health services for routine care and disturbs the higher education system that will deliver the next generation of health professionals. But war also causes deeper and more insidious damage to the mental health and resilience of individuals and societies. This is particularly challenging for those who are exposed to the most intimate experience of war, combat. NATO countries know this from the challenges that we have faced over the last two decades in providing sufficient and appropriate mental health services for our veterans of the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. However, our experience pales into insignificance when we consider the realities of the scale and likely toll of the war in Ukraine on the men and women who are both fighting on the front line or have been exposed to the uh, intensity of combat um, during the Russian invasion. So their experience of war is much more intense and much more dramatic than the one we have uh, a narrative in our own countries. And so this panel will consider how the psychosocial support programmes can be prioritised in conflict settings. Our speakers will explore how innovative programming, such as mainstreaming interventions into broader livelihood programmes and context-specific trauma services, encourages participation and complements efforts to cater for the needs of men and women in conflict settings, and especially the veterans. So we will start with some remarks from University College Dublin except researcher Heidi Riley, who's here, and her work explores the intersections of masculinity, trauma and male mental health and how these elements impact gender norms, driving social support provision within conflict. We'll be followed by Masi Nahim, who's online, and he's a Ukrainian veteran and lawyer. He's been awarded the Medal for Military Valor the Wounds Medal and the Firearms Award of the Ministry of Defence of Ukraine. And he will speak about the current experience and support needs of troops and veterans in Ukraine. Our last speaker will be Ivona Kostinia. She's also uh, here online and she's the current head of the Ukrainian NGO Veteran Hub. And she will discuss current and future challenges to veteran and combat reintegration into Ukrainian society. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, then 15 minutes with their prepared remarks, after which we'll have time for questions and answers. So let's start with uh, Dr. Heidi Riley. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, I'm delighted to, to be here today. Thank you so much to the, to the organisers um, for inviting me to participate with the, such an esteemed panel um, with Avona and Massey um, and Martin. Um, so, as Martin uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning, sadly, this event um, marks um, the second anniversary of the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and also, um, uh, we have to remember that this is an extension of a decade-long conflict um, in, in the eastern part of Ukraine that's been ongoing since 2014. And unfortunately, this has meant for the people of Ukraine, and particularly for those on the front line, they've suffered huge physical toll both um, in terms of the people, but in also infrastructure. And of course, the psychological impact will have effect on the lives and communities well beyond the end of the conflict. Now, Ukraine's military, we have to remember, includes large numbers of recruits that were, were in civilian positions prior to the invasion. And they've de demonstrated incredible resilience. But it's crucial that the psychological scars arising out of it are recognised, they're responded to, and they're supported. So before I continue, I just want to make a couple of clarifications. So this piece of research that I've been working on um, uh, through King's College with Accept um, is, um, um, isn't specifically on Ukraine, but I think the research, um, it, the findings and the themes do have resonance across all conflicts. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, it's, it does focus specifically on masculinity and conflict related trauma, more so in, uh, in relation to civilian masculinities and not necessarily military masculinities, although I have done some work in this area before. But in the research, I've been looking into, mas into um, manifestations of conflict related trauma amongst men, how gender norms both shape men's responses to trauma and psychosocial support services, and what services are available 
that specifically target the needs of men um, in conflict affected and fragile states. However, I just want to, to make the point that this focus on men is not meant in any way to overshadow recognition of the diverse experiences of women in conflict, including as combatant, combatants, which I recognize, of course, um, it, many women are also serving in the Ukrainian military. And it's certainly not intended to overshadow the often disproportionate physical and psych psychological harms faced by women and girls in conflict contexts and the vital need for access to appropriate support services in response. Am I, can I change the slide now? Great, yeah. So just to, just to start off with a really broad definition of trauma, which we take as the psychological state developed when the experience of threat overwhelms an individual's coping resources. Now, this definition definition is very broad and it's also open to, to some contestation. But I briefly want to just highlight some of the debates that I've been grappling with in, in, in this research. So firstly, the condition post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which we often think about when, when we talk about um, conflict related conflict related trauma. It's very much a Western clinical term, fairly recently recognized and originally associated with militarized trauma. And actually, if we look at the history of the term PTSD, it does tell us something, do we say, about masculine expectations associated with resilience in the military. So in previous centuries, servicemen who displayed maybe trauma symptoms, such as anxiety, depression, sadness, weren't always taken seriously. But they might have been ridiculed some, in some way by, um, you know, as not real men. Um, and it wasn't really until about World War One time that such symptoms, symptoms were in any, any way recognised. And but at this time, it, they weren't really recognised as a psychological condition stemming from the proximity um, of the horror, stemming from proximity to the horrors of war. But the explanation um, of these extreme symptoms tended to be defined in terms of shell shock, so associated with concussion. So it was seen more as a condition stemming from physical harm to the head rather than a mental health condition in itself. Because, you know, this stems from a very much an idea that men were not supposed to be emotional, they're not supposed to be vulnerable, and particularly um, military men. So it wasn't really until the return of US soldiers from Vietnam in the 1970s that veterans and mental health professionals succeeded in influencing the third revision of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, creating the diagnostic category of PTSD. So while recognition of PTSD has been positive, its recognition also gives way to other debates around how it translates across cultures. Firstly, where diagnosis of the root of PTSD or trauma is stemming from a single or multiple traumatic experience, it can also overlook the intersection of traumatic experience and daily stresses. For example, poverty, displacement, continued insecurity, which may perpetuate symptoms associated with, with trauma or PTSD. Secondly, PTSD is very much an individualist condition stemming from an individual's response to traumatic experience. Therefore, it requires an individualist response. However, there is a, some debate around how this precedence of the individualist approach can overlook collectivist or more indigenous approaches that may be more appropriate in certain contexts. And as we're discussing a masculinity perspective, it's also important to mention that trauma and daily stresses have cultural, social and gendered meanings. So, for example, if we take, for example, daily stressors from a masculinity perspective, things like an inability to provide for the for the family may take on a particular gendered meaning where expectations of masculinity or cultural expectations of masculinity dictate that men are supposed to be, for example, the breadwinners. Could we just go on to the next slide? <clears throat> so I might just, just very briefly flip through um, um, why traumatic experiences during conflict are gendered. So for example, men and boys are more frequently targeted with direct violence they're more likely to be victims of summary execution. And in unstable contexts or situations of dictatorial crackdown, men and boys are more frequently targeted for imprisonment or torture, particularly where there's a fear of mass recruitment into an armed group. At the same time, the risk of incarceration or forced recruitment into a rebel group may lead to dangerous forms of migration where journeys may consist of multiple traumatic experiences. 
men and boys may also be experienced experience trauma as a result of wartime sexual violence or, 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 or sexual torture, often associated with women in conflict. Um, but often this is aimed at, should we say, removing the victim's manhood. So it's a very gendered act, act shall we say. And for the victim, this may have long term implications, both physical and psychological. For example, where it leads to impotence, this may further perpetuate psychological difficulties, particularly in a context where the ability to be sexually is defined in terms of a sense of masculinity or one's place in society. And of course, wartime trauma across all populations stem from, for example, family, um, uh, losing family fr friends, or in a military context, maybe it's um, the loss of friends or comrades that where the close bonds have been created during conflict. Um, and psychological responses in this case may be associated with, with guilt. Why, why, me, why him, not me? Or was there something that I could have done to save him? But coming back to this current research I've been working on with Excerpt, part of the research has been looking at what services there are to support psychosocial needs of men and boys, and what are the implications of not providing support? Now, I should note, that I wasn't really looking at, at veteran organisations, but I think this is going to be discussed more in the following uh, presentations. Um, but I focus more on humanitarian responses. So I interviewed 12 organisations operating in South Sudan, Iraq and Syria. Out of this sample, only two operated psychosocial support programmes for specifically targeted at men. Now, this is only a very small sample, of course, but it's consistent with findings across various literatures that document both the lack of services and a lack of donor buy-in often um, for support services for men and boys. In, in fact, findings in other literature show how, in some cases, humanitarian responses themselves can reinforce um, uh, can stereotypes, negative stereotypes that reinforce the assumption around the incompatibility between masculinity and vulnerability, or reinforce the often dominant men as perpetrators, women as victims, which also has implications for how women are perceived in conflict um, as, as kind of lacking agency, shall we say. So why is it, um, uh, why is a lack of appropriate services problematic? Well, we argue that this is problematic because, first of all, um, from a well-being perspective, the perspective of the individual, and also in terms of violence prevention. Now, we know from other research uh, on men and, mass and mental health more broadly, that men are often reluctant to admit psychological difficulties or trauma for fear of stigma, particularly where an emotional response might be seen as a sign of weakness. Therefore, where there's no services available or no services designed in a way that are accessible to men, then it's even more unlikely that they're going to reach out for help. Now, if we look at the psychology literature, we also find that men are typically, typically more likely to score on the avoidance strand of PTSD diagnosis. Problematically, this can block important emotional outlets for dealing with trauma. So where trauma is internalised, it can at times manifest in different ways, um, uh, including violence um, in, in different ways. Um, now, don't, I certainly don't want to go down the route of claiming that all men are violent and women are peaceful and men, all men under pressure are going to resort to violence. But there is research out there that, that shows how men are more likely to develop negative coping mechanisms in response to trauma. So, for example, rates of substance abuse, abuse risk-taking behaviour, withdrawal, self-harm, violence tend to be higher amongst men suffering from mental health difficulties. And the literature does show also a correlation between PTSD and intimate partner violence or gender-based violence. And there's been a lot of work in the military masculinity literature here. For example, in the US, there was a systematic review that took place recently that um, showed that um, uh, US military veterans suffering from PT PTSD found um, a prevalence rate um, sorry, um, um, engaged in, in, in um, uh, prevalence of I IPV amongst the US uh, male military veterans, veteran, pardon me, and prevalence rate of 27.5%. And there's also other research in the feminist literature on rates of uh, domestic violence going up after the return of soldiers from conflict. So looking, uh, so but also beyond domestic violence, there is also indications that manifestations of trauma amongst men can contribute to community violence or political violence. But looking through this, uh, at this through a masculinity, through the lens of masculine expectations, trauma and men amongst men and boys may also be perpetuated by increased daily stresses, where trauma manifestations manifest in negative behaviours 
anxiety or depression, this may impede uh, the ability to secure employment and in turn increasing stress and frustration, turning into a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, so this is and also it can perpetuate maybe a sense of a lack of um, sense of lack of agency, particularly uh, in a military context where during conflict there has been a sense of agency as part of a mission, but where the reintegration into civilian life life has actually um, led to a sense of a lack of agency or particularly disillusionment where the outcome hasn't been what what was expected. But just finally, I want to come back to the theme of um, so can we have the next slide. Sorry, the theme of today. Um, this of rethinking resilience. So, particularly in the context of military masculinities. Now, I'm not going to say that I have any answers to how to rethink masculinity, uh, rethink resilience. Pardon me. Um, but just before I finish up, I just want to problematize the, the the concept. Typical academic. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, resilience in the military, in particular, can again be understood very much as an individualized concept. To be resilient is to be tough, to be strong, to be brave, resilient for the cause, often reinforced through militarized, stereotypical masculine language. Now, of course, there is the resilience of the unit or mission itself, but as an individual soldier, your own individual resilience becomes relied upon by the unit. Therefore, what's created is a value position where resilience is valued as a position of strength, a valued form of masculinity, opposed to the opposite, which is portrayed in terms of a weaker, less valued. So after injury, this position of strength or demonstrations of resilient masculinity may long, no longer be possible or needs to be take, needs to take a different form. Now, where there's a physical injury, this is assumed as acceptable. It's also more likely to be recognized. But where there's a mental health issue, where it's not seen, particularly amongst those who have not been physically injured, it can be portrayed particularly by the individual as well, as a failure of resilience and therefore can curtail the ability to admit or ask for help. And this might be particularly the case where the psychological stress is not seen, seen as stemming from a direct in combat, in combat incident. So while the establishment of veteran support services amongst Western militaries are vital, particularly to normalize a call for help and to challenge the current disassociation of masculinity and vulnerability, I, it, it's okay to be a man and be vulnerable, and also to address the stigmas around men and mental health. I would argue that there's a need to, that for these services to be designed using a gendered analysis, taking account of multiple masculinities, including LGBT masculinities, recognizing differences in coping, mechanism, coping mechanisms, and also recognizing non combat trauma. Another thing to think about is the, oh, pardon me, please, please, could you just. The last one there. Another thing to um, to mention is the social ecology approach. This is where the emphasis is more on well-being, and it turns this the, the focus more towards the bio-directional in, interactions between the individual and the environment. So this encompasses a shift from the purely uh, psychosocial support services as a, a as a, um, a service on its own, but more takes account of the intersections of trauma and daily stresses, um, for example, by integrating um, psychosocial support programs into livelihood initiatives or retraining programs or addressing issues of social cohesion and emotional support network. So just to, to, as a final uh, comment before I finish up, while we're, again, while we're talking about men and masculinity and the, the importance of PSS programming for men, I do want to re-emphasize that in addition, there is a vital need and much more to be done on ensuring resources for women as well, both in the military and non-military context, both in Ukraine and across all conflicts affected by states. And they also need to support, be supported there as well. So thank you for listening. So Heidi, thank you very much for uh, your opening remarks, getting us to think a little bit more than just the numbers of psychologists and psychiatrists needed to provide mental health services and getting us to think about the challenge of reintegrating the combat veteran back into becoming a citizen and their role in society and the extent to which that should be um, should recognize gender as opposed to be completely gender neutral. So without setting a scene around uh, post-conflict psychological support services, 
let me now hand over to Massey Nihim to give his presentation from a veteran's perspective and the role of veterans organisations in supporting um, people who have experienced the realities of combat. Over to you, Massey. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, last year, our organization, uh, first of all, I, uh, I just want to say that uh, I will read because uh, my English is not very well. That's why I, some, some words I, uh, I don't uh, remember. So, sorry for that. So, um, uh, last year, our, our organization conducted two studies uh, of the path of wounded personnel. Uh, and uh, uh, you see presentation, you can see, uh, you can see in the slide uh, a quote of, from one of Ukrainian warriors. Uh, I think this quote reflects perfectly the meaning of uh, defending our country and price we are, we are already to pay for uh, its uh, uh, sovereignty. Uh, th these two pieces of research that Human Rights Center Princip conducted show that uh, Com comprehensive uh, rehabilitation of military personnel, uh, personnel uh, and veterans is a huge challenge for the state. Uh, psychology help is one of this challenge. Uh, so the three percent of our uh, inter cutters uh, admitted that they need psychological help, and 50 percent predict that they will need psychological help in the future. This. Uh, Percentage is the highest among uh, respondents um, under the age of uh, 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 40. Uh, taking, taking into account the uh, ongoing full-scale invasion, Ukraine lack, uh, lacks resources to provide quality rehabilitation of military personnel suffering, uh, suffering from physical and mental health issues. Now, for now, this help is uh, fragmentary and not, uh, and not uh, Compensive, uh, often depending on the resource of the families of such military personnel and uh, veterans. Some of such needs uh, can be uh, covered by the uh, by the resource of uh, uh, private funds, including international owns. Uh, however, these uh, are private initiatives and uh, are not uh, united by a single program. Therefore, these initiatives are efficient in the uh, certain cases, but the state uh, still lacks um, a unified program for the satisfaction, uh, satisfaction um, of these people's uh, needs. The purpose of my speech is to reveal the phenomenon of Ukrainian veteran in the um, circumstances of full-scale war to better understand that uh, what kind of support uh, he or she needs. Uh, yes, uh, in Ukraine fight not only men, but uh, women too. Additionally, I would like to call for a professional discussion of what can be done to provide a decent uh, life uh, to Ukrainian soldiers after returning from the service. In my points, I will refer to data collection uh, co collected during the uh, research of the Human Rights uh, Center principle and to my personal experiences uh, to demonstrate the experience of modern Ukrainian veterans. So, uh, now we only start. Who is Ukrainian veteran now? Uh, since uh, martial law has been declared in the country, you can be released from service only after a serious injury uh, the, uh, that, uh, that causes uh, disability. Of course, there are, uh, there are other reasons, but they are not so common. Before uh, being released, you need, first of all, to come to your uh, sense after your serious injury to release yourself in your uh, new body which no longer works uh, as before to collect a bunch of documents to pass uh, various medical co uh, commissions to get uh, necessary uh, statuses, uh, benefits and payments. I remember myself when it's uh, help, uh, when it's uh, when I was wounded, uh, only one thing that I, uh, I want, I want to come back to home and just to walk with my dog because uh, it's, it's important for me. Only then uh, I, 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 I think that I will start to live my new life with this wounded. 
Uh, so, in the best case, in six months to a year, uh, you will be able to leave the service after uh, bureaucratic uh, pro uh, procedures and move to civil life. But at the same time, you have to be treated, uh, uh, recuperate and work to uh, establish uh, teas with your family uh, uh, all this time. And it's important to mention uh, that during our all this time the war is still going on what does it mean to keep in touch with your common uh, comrades uh, who are on the bat uh, battlefield every day you have worry about them and feel guilty for the being with them if you have enough stre uh, strength and uh, then you try to help them while in the rear organize a collection of money for uh, ammunition and for the for them and other Things um, they are constantly lacking uh, at the front: cars, drones, starlings, etc. Or do other vo volunteer uh, activities to help them. You do not leave join groups, uh, chats in messengers, and uh, are yeah, and uh, are constantly in the context of combat operations and experiences of your com uh, comrades. Uh, comrades, when someone dies, most likely you feel uh, you will feel guilty too meanwhile uh, you uh, you can be in a settlement that it's uh, constantly being uh, shelled by russia it can be a frontline hospital where you have been immediately transported uh, tra transported after being wounded this uh, hospital is needed uh, is indeed uh, within uh, reach of um, uh, artillery shelling it also can be a more distant, uh, distant city, for example, your hometown where you con uh, continue rehabilitation. But this city is also being uh, bombarded with cries miceless. At the same time, you are a person with limited mobility who needs to react to alarms and go down to, sh to the shelter. Unfortunately, Ukrainian cities, let alone villages, are not uh, uh, barrier-free environments. Not being able to take shelter is not the worst effect of war in civil life, of course. The feeling uh, of not being uh, able to protect your own family from shell uh, shelling will uh, hit you the hardest. However, is it uh, also possible uh, it's also possible um, that you uh, that your wife and child are not uh, with you at all because they had to flee. Uh, from the war to another country. I will not uh, delve into in the topic of family problems that uh, arose because families were forced to separate. The variety of uh, these problems is separate topic. And at the same time, you need to realize yourself in this life. The irre irreversible, irre irreversible changes have taken place in uh, your body and it's difficult to uh, for your co uh, comprehend and uh, accept them so uh, you do not have time op uh, or, or opportunity for this because you constantly have to solve current uh, issues in uh, relations with uh, the state unfortunately uh, unfortunately um, after the after an injury Injury and the state does not have the resource to secure your possibility to not deal with these issues. Last year, our non-government organization started its work with simple things such as uh, such as accessibility information about rights and uh, benefits for the injured uh, servicemen. Imagine that a military man go to the hospital and had no idea what to do with his documents. More, more moreover. This, uh, this is a uh, disciplinary uh, liability for not dealing with all these documents. So most of the current military and future veterans uh, are ci uh, civilians in the past who have been never engaged in military work and never dreamed of it. So they don't know military rules. They often don't understand that uh, things happened um, uh, di uh, differently in the army. For example, after being uh, discharged uh, from the hospital, you can't just go home and lie on the bed. Uh, at the time of the first mobilization, the state did not have the resources to tell them uh, and uh, these rules and uh, procedures. 
uh, it's left only two minutes, so I will, I, I will end my speech. After being injured, uh, injured uh, military personnel, uh, personnel uh, often feel frustrated because they are realized that they will no longer be able to serve and they fear that they will not be able to get a job in civil life. In general, and uh, interaction with the state, which, uh, which is not always uh, possible, uh, makes them w uh, worry about the future. 72% of our um, interlocutors uh, uh, say that, uh, that they are afraid that the state will forget about them. 72%. We can't. Uh, we cannot uh, turn a blind um, eye to problem uh, that some uh, veterans believe that uh, civilians will never understand them because of a lack of uh, shared experience. Being among such uh, people of also um, affects the uh, psycho-emotional uh, state of veterans. Uh, this is a very brief portrait of modern Ukrainian veterans in order to, uh, to emphasize uh, you know, one important uh, dif uh, differences between veterans of previous uh, periods as well as, uh, as veterans in the, our states. This is not a person, uh, a person who, was, uh, who has uh, finally uh, transition, transitioned uh, to the status of civilian. Also, uh, according uh, to the documents he can be consider considered uh, permanently discharged from the services mostly these people continue to consider uh, themselves uh, as a part of the military community uh, um, they identify themselves as warriors they uh, comrades continue to fight and they do not become uh, deta detached uh, from the context of war even if you imagine that they cut off contact with their comrades is obviously impossible to avoid the context of the uh, war in Ukraine because they continue to maintain the, their uh, household to deal with their uh, treatment and uh, rehabilitation issues during a full-scale invasion. Um, this environment, let's be, hon be honest, will not soon have the proper condi condition for uh, Educate reintegration of veterans, starting from the lack of uh, sufficient uh, resource and ending with the general state of society. Because the Ukraine veterans return from the battle, uh, battlefield, not a peaceful life, but not the rear area. However, it's important to understand that the civil population is also suffering. It's not comparing it uh, to the military personnel, uh, but it's comparison uh, with the cities, uh, citizens uh, of the state uh, without the ongoing war. And uh, with all these uh, conduct, uh, uh, conditions, we come uh, to another important to prob uh, problem. In Ukraine, there is no uh, comprehensive uh, rehabilitation and speci uh, specialists who can do it. In particular, those who can provide uh, professional psychological help. This uh, requires uh, a lot of work from us. First, uh, we shall uh, we shall ensure uh, institutional development and uh, state uh, strengthening of institutions and bodies that can provide this uh, assistance. Secondly, it's important to improve the educational system because people need to be uh, tough, uh, taught how to pro properly uh, provide this help. Uh, and uh, these are the challenges uh, facing us. It's important that the state and society uh, uh, adequately uh, reintegrate the veterans in the civil uh, civilian life um, of our country in uh, circumstances of the war. It's the uh, least we can do, the, do to thank our soldiers for this service, and we would like to do it as soon as possible with the help of our partners. And thank you for support. Yes, um, this, this, this is why uh, last year, together with uh, Human Rights Defender Lyubov Halan, we create um, the non government organization principle. To become the voice of military and veterans to effectively uh, to effectively uh, communicate their needs to the state and uh, ultimately uh, strength and the state uh, in its uh, relations with the people who came 
calm its defense. And last one. You can always uh, contact us with, with email uh, or other resources uh, through the links uh, on the last slide. I thank you for attention, for uh, inviting me to this uh, incredible event. We are uh, eager to hear from you soon uh, and are open to uh, me, uh, meaningful collaboration. And I'm so sorry about my uh, English. So. I, I think I read well everything. <laughs> Massey, let me reassure you that your English came across exceptionally well uh, here in the uh, for the physical audience, and that you provided a very uh, harrowing and personal account of the live reality. Um, for um, a veteran from the from the war in Ukraine, and you emphasised the importance of having a integrated pathway of care from point of wounding all the way through to reintegration back into society, um, and uh, also described very nicely your sense of identity with your uh, fellow warriors, even though you're not standing next to them in the front line. So you've given us some really important things to think about um, as we go on now to uh, Ivona. And if I could ask you, uh, Ivona, to give us um, a perspective of um, the future challenges for veterans. Um, and uh, I know we're running slightly over time, but actually don't worry about that because it's really important. We hear everything that you have to say as well. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I hope my connection is OK. Uh, please, can you confirm that you can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. OK, thank you. So good day. Um, I represent an organization called Veteran Hub. It was created as an idea in 2016, uh, soon after the beginning of the war and piloted in 2018. Uh, until the beginning of the full scale invasion in 2022, we've been caring for the well-being of Ukrainian veterans and their families by providing a broad range of psychosocial services from employment to legal counseling to mental health support. Uh, and we built a network of safe spaces where veterans can turn to to receive support and services. However, most of our clients have been remobilized since the beginning of the full scale invasion, making it impossible to continue working with them because they turned to the front lines. Masi uh, has just painted a very comprehensive portrait of the Ukrainian veteran. I would like to emphasize that, in fact, many Ukrainian veterans continue military service even today. And there is a large share of people for whom this current stage of war is the second or more experience of military service in a decade. And I think that it is important to understand when building a comprehensive system of care for the future of Ukrainian um, veterans, because we must admit that most of them will remain in the reserve. Unlike veterans in most Ukrainian countries, Ukrainian veterans after ATO GFO had to build their journey back to civilian life during an active war. It is a challenge of itself to go through the military civilian transitions, especially after such a long term uh, period in the front lines. But when doing it, once the war is not over, once it happening, what is happening in your own country, once your family is affected, it is an even more complicated challenge for them. It is also important to, to remember that most of the people who will be demobilized in the future, as Messi mentioned, there is no active demobilization happening now and only the minority of people are being demobilized today. However, in the future, um, they will remain in Ukraine's reserve, meaning they can be remobilized once again in their lifetime. So when speaking about civilian reintegration to civilian life, we're not speaking about putting down roots, unfortunately. We're not speaking about reinventing your civilian identity. We're speaking more about resilience and the capacity to adapt to change and the capacity to adapt your whole livelihood to the constant risk of war with Russia that is dictated by our ge geographical position. And in the document that Massey actually showed in one of the slides in the policy brief for the Ukrainian government, we emphasize the point that the reserve forces have to be considered very differently in the way Ukraine perceives its veteran policy. In fact, almost 100% of our reserve force will be combat veterans, and those people will have to remain fit for, for service while also trying to balance a social capital and civilian life. And yes, the majority will be male. However, there is a large share of women also uh, in, in the forces at the moment and will be joining in the future. 
uh, we talk a lot about the journeys and what happened to Ukrainian ATO GFO veterans after military service and before the second military service in our study called the journeys of veterans that was conducted with, together with IREX under the veteran reintegration uh, program supported by the US Department of State. It is published on our website, you can look through it, but basically it unfolds what is going on between the war and tells us an important message that reintegration during a war takes a lot of time. Most of the people who responded to that um, interviews that we conducted, they took five to seven years to only start feeling good back in civilian life. Ironically, it took the same time for the war to start all over again in their own life. So they actually didn't have the time to enjoy that civilian life and the roots that they had um, the chance to create. Uh, in response to the fact that most clients were remobilized, Veteran Hub immediately turned its attention to the family members of veterans and warriors and launched a national trust line on March 11, 2022, just two weeks into the full scale invasion. Uh, while our own team was forced to evacuate and there were a lot of people getting mobilized from within the team. Since then, we've learned about the unique experiences of the spouses, partners and families of our warriors uh, and conducted a study on their journey called the Journeys of the Warriors Beloved One. Unlike many examples that we've seen in the international literature, we take a look at um, the experiences of spouses and families from a per, um, perspective of a subject in the process, not only a caregiver, but actually a person who's going through a whole different complex experience. And we see that definitely Ukrainian families of um, the military are affected very much through the combat experiences of their loved ones, and they should be considered very carefully in the development of programs for support not only for the veteran and the warrior, but also for the family as a subject to the process. Just as a small um, image of what is happening is that most of those mostly female uh, audiences, they didn't actually know that they will become the spouse of a military. It happened suddenly, they never planned for a life like that. And they had to adapt to the change and to, into the change in their livelihood and their relationship, but also take on a huge load of responsibility during a wartime. Um, as Messi mentioned, warriors cannot protect their own family when they're protecting the country. And thus this defensive um, role in the family, it actually becomes the role of the woman in most cases or the man in cases of um, uh, multiple, in some cases that we've had, we've seen in our role. Actually, it doesn't only come down to defense. It also comes to, down to economic stability of the family, the planning of the family, the connection with all of the other family members, the contingency planning, the care for all of other uh, family members, not only the children. Um, we think that the caregiving role has to be recognized very well, but it's also important to advocate for the recognition of all the other roles the spouses are taking on. Unfortunately, at the moment, um, the spouses are somehow in between two worlds as well as the uh, other family members. So on the one hand, you're not a civilian because your life is so much different. You live during a war without a loved one, you're constantly in worry and you have zero predictability of your own future. You're constantly in threat that it will change to the worst. Uh, but you're also not in the military. You're not part of the peer community. You're not connected to other family members. You are just there on your own with your quite subjective and different experience. Um, I think that uh, what should be done soon in Ukraine is we have to um, ensure that there is recognition on the governmental level, not only as praise for what they've been doing, but also just as data collection and the ability to know actually the portrait of this audience. Because unfortunately at the moment, we have no valid data on what is the community of the spouses and of the family members. There is a lot going on in the family unit apart from the relationship between the couple. We know that military personnel, even during a war, even during active combat service, decide on to take on parenting roles, even new parenting roles. They engage in conscious parenting, often malinformed about the ancestral trauma and the peculiarities of the impact of the uh, paternal and maternal PTSD and other uh, mental health conditions on the child and on their parenting patterns. We've done a project to address that and it's only in the beginning of it we did a small research on the parenting patterns in military families and it's also available online. I would also want to call to attention here uh, the mothers and fathers, particularly the fathers in the context of our particular um, conversation today, the males of a lot of older age who cannot join service because of their age, but whose children are in service and they have a very high sense of guilt. And we find that this audience is um, the hardest to approach with our programming. So we have 
mothers coming and reaching out for services. We have siblings, but we don't have fathers reaching out for programs and they don't accept help when offered. It's also very hard to target programs towards them and to develop them in a way that male fathers would actually accept them. Um, I would want to spend a bit more time today to speak about the systematic issues that we've uncovered while working also together with Massey's organization Princip and with other partners under the um, policy brief for the government. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand Ukraine doesn't have a developed mental health care system. So when veterans as clients come to the health care system, they don't have a service to rely upon and we're building it as the war goes on. So at the moment, um, this spans a wide range of, of problems for all clients, including veterans. First of all, is a lack of qualified service provider, making the service purely accessible to veterans, their families and general population. This won't be solved fast. It takes time to teach mental health care providers, meaning that at the moment, uh, we perceive the mental health service as a therapeutic service, as an elite service, which is becoming more and more expensive, more and more inaccessible, uh, and actually concentrated in large regions where there is a big population of um, uh, citizens, but also where there is concentration of donor funding. Um, in rural areas, families, uh, veterans and themselves will have hardships in accessing this service, even if it's offered online due to uh, disruptions in service provision and online um, service provision and others, and also online doesn't work for everybody. So for example, we do mobile office services, traveling out to the rural areas and providing the service at home, but it is once in a lifetime experience. You don't do that on a weekly basis as needed. It's also important to understand that there is a poor client referral system and criteria for qualifying for service. So basically uh, it's a first come first serve um, approach in most service providers, uh, meaning that not always the people in most need will get the such uh, needed elite spot for therapy. Um, there's also lack of cultural competency and awareness, shrinking that number of people who can provide the service to a, keep a smaller amount of people. Uh, service providers are not aware of the experiences of veterans and their loved ones, and they, they need to get acquainted with that fast and with the military culture overall and the effects it can have on people, just to make sure we have as many people as possible engaged. Uh, and finally, uh, on the problem side, veterans and their loved ones are not recognized and tracked within the healthcare system. So basically, as soon as the person is demobilized, we have no data on their health and we cannot track and do any prevention and actually address it on a um, evidence based um, approach. We're advocating for that recognition. It is a problematic issue because it stems to the um, uh, discrimination in some cases, and it has to be addressed very carefully. And it's also considered data of the military because once again, most of them are in the reserve and um, they will be in an interesting cohort. Um, uh, but we think that some level of data collection has to be there and there has to be analysis of this data in order to actually inform Ukrainian based programming that would address the needs of those people. Um, in that policy brief that we mentioned, we came to a conclusion that unfortunately, in the next decade, we don't see it feasible to provide therapy and health, mental health care to all those people in need. And that is a status quo. There is a lot going on and there is a lot of complementary efforts that we want to um, celebrate here. But it's also important to understand the reality in order to build better programming for, for our clients. We um, think that it will take up to a decade to grow a generation of providers sufficient to sustain the, the need, but the problem is already there and we already have the need for, for support. Thus, um, knowing that journeys veterans takes a lifetime, we are happy to confirm positive steps are being taken towards creating the system today. Um, however, keeping in mind all the barriers and systematic challenges, we must focus on creative solutions for the mental health of our veterans and their families, focusing primarily on community support and on informing the client themselves. I would say that the information access about mental health care is currently um, insufficient and a lot of programs that are communicating mental health to veterans, um, in my subjective and professional uh, judgment, they use the wrong language. They are too complicated to actually deliver the message, what's okay, what's not okay with you, and how to solve those issues on a very basic level. We should consider the veteran a part of that team of healthcare and their family a part of the team of healthcare with which it starts. We also suggest that more uh, service providers that are not particularly mental health providers, such as primary healthcare providers, 
uh, teachers, educators, mentors should be involved in the programming at their level of connection. It's not necessarily therapeutic interventions. It can all be primary psychological support, informing, uh, sharing knowledge about the available programs and others. Um, of course, veterans walk their journey by themselves and they take all the challenges by themselves, but they're not they're not alone. And there are a lot of people who care and those people should be able to do their job better. Today, Veteran Hub acts on the crossroads between a service provider, a think tank and the media. We truly believe that in communities that support veterans and their families well, there is no need in the Veteran Hub. And of course, it is an utopian dream uh, to have a community that doesn't need uh, an intervention as the one that we're offering today. But in our daily work, we focus on identifying meaningful interactions, meaningful relationships and roles in society that veterans interact with naturally without our help and informing those stakeholders on what we know from daily interactions with our clients, from what we learn from listening to them and having the benefit and privilege to listen for hours and hours of their storytelling. So we act as a bridge between different people with different experiences, and we hope that this will help actually be build a better care for both mental health care, but also for the general well-being of veterans as they will be reintegrating during the war. Thank you. Ivona, thank you very much indeed for your remarks, um, which are, are definitely complementary to the previous two speakers. Uh, and indeed, many of the topics that um, have now been highlighted reflect the same uh, evolutionary journey and narrative we've faced um, in sort of NATO and Western countries in dealing with um, the veterans uh, from uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Perhaps the biggest difference is that your war is continuing and that the veteran doesn't leave the theatre of war, the veteran is still living in the theatre of war with their families and the whole society is still in that theatre of war. So with that um, as sort of a setting, I wonder if anybody from the audience here have got any questions that they'd like to pose. Um, right at the back, first off, if you could introduce yourself and then uh, place your question, that would be great. Of course, thank you very much. Um, my name is Piers Holland, I try to work within the Ministry of Defence. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you uh, to Thank you to everybody uh, online and uh, in the room for a fascinating series of uh, presentations. Uh, I think that the broad topic uh, is really important to, to me. In the previous role, I was a, a Royal Air Force Station commander and we championed the broader mental health uh, issue uh, with the strap line. It, it, it's okay not to be okay to try and get people to take the first step and come forward. But I think, as you correctly said, ours is a slightly different problem from that which um, you know our colleagues uh, on the screen in Ukraine uh, which I want to say huge respect uh, for uh, are facing. Um, I guess my question is about um, pre-conflict and to ask if it's a valid idea and concept to do uh, much more pre-conflict to help uh, prepare uh, and to mitigate the effects of conflict. Because I think our discussion today is focused very much on and, and you know entirely valid post-conflict support uh, and I'm very interested in the idea of what can be done in training as obviously the UK MOD provides an awful lot of training uh, it's to prepare people for the rigors of what lies ahead. So I just quickly summarize the question the question is can, can you reduce the uh, impact of um, mental trauma from conflict by pre-deployment and recruit training? Um, I, I think I think I need to translation if 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 it's if we can do it. I can. Як можна знизити вплив на на ветеранів, на учасників війни від травми, пов'язаної з конфліктом, перед їхнім відправленням на війну і після їхнього звільнення? Okay, uh, I can uh, I can answer, but uh, okay, I try. Oh, 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 I'm a gentleman, so maybe one of one, one to first. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, first of all, uh, 
we need uh, we need to uh, to take them information what's happened with them uh, well in front line. Uh, it's very important because when I was wounded and come back in home, I don't understand what what's happened with me. I don't understand uh, what stress I have. I think it's uh, no no problem, you know. It's uh, like a joke, you know. Uh, without one eye, you know, you 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 like a god, uh, Odin, if you know. Uh, so it's very it was very cool. But uh, the problem is that. Until today, I don't understand what's happened with me uh, uh, when I was in front line. It's stress. It's a lot of things that change your mind. Uh, I think that if we uh, can uh, um, can say for this uh, uh, warrior what's happened, it can help them. It's first of all. Uh, second is uh, it's a society. You know, uh, when society understand uh, for what you uh, fight, uh, when society understand, yeah, it's very help uh, uh, help you because uh, in the period before 2022, uh, most of society in Ukraine don't understand what is war, for what we fight. They uh, they don't understand. And now, when it's uh, war in all Ukraine, uh, you uh, every day just uh, see some support uh, from society. It's very help helpful. And the the last one is important uh, to to take uh, some services for uh, for uh, relatives of uh, this uh, veteran uh, because uh, first of all who uh, meet you when you come back from uh, frontline, it's uh, your uh, wife, your uh, parents. Uh, so it's very important to uh, to uh, say them uh, uh, who I am now, uh, who, who come back from frontline, you know, because when I go in frontline, it uh, was another people, another man. Uh, uh, and when I come back, it's uh, something uh, I have some some changes <laughs> yeah, not physically only uh, I think so these three things uh, can help I think thank you Ivana do you have any observations yeah I would like to add that I think that mitigation is um possible to some extent it would definitely be very helpful to inform um, people about what they should expect as an experience I think the training to um, cope with complicated conditions uh, would definitely be also complementary in, uh, in this case but um, I think that because of the type of war that we are facing because of the long-term exposure to combat because of the long-term exposure to um, very harsh combat, it's not always possible to mitigate the consequences. And specifically because you might tell people you should look out for those and those symptoms, but if I don't have a service provider to turn to when they do figure out those symptoms, like what, what should they do next? How do they cope with it? Mm. Also, I just think it's important to consider that many people don't go through international training. They go through very fast mobilization that doesn't actually allow enough time to even absorb the military, uh, the civilian to military transition and identity crisis that the person is going through, specifically nowadays. Um, so it's a very complicated question to answer. But what I think it should definitely be addressed in those is informing about traumatic brain injuries, which are so prevalent among Ukrainian warriors and the both mental and physical consequences this might have over time. Because we know from research that most of them are not diagnosed um, in a timely manner. They're not addressed in a timely manner specifically by commanders. So when commanders know that there has been a TBI, they don't allow for those important first um, steps that must be taken when the person is physically ill at the moment. And they also don't know about how those can manifest themselves six months to a year later. And this information sharing should be um, improved at the beginning in training and also throughout service and throughout all training programs, in my opinion, that are happening for commanders in the Ukrainian army. Thank you. Uh, Heidi, any points? Yeah, just uh, briefly, I suppose. I mean, I, th I think the, the conversation around vulnerability 
within military training um, is, is extremely important. And I, and I think that is changing somewhat. You know, the idea of that, that, that military training is all, all about being the military warrior has changed somewhat. But I think increasing that conversation around, um, you know, the realities of of conflict and the impact that that could have on the individual, but also in that in that training is to ensure that 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 recruits have the security of the services that are available to them, so that it's not some, something that's just spoken about, but it's something that can be can be a service that can be accessed, and it's there's no stigma around accessing that service, um, um, you know, if if it arises. So again, it's about this. this I think the security that those supports are in place and when supports are in place it normalizes um, the ability to be able to go and ask for a help and I think that's that's important now of course just you know referring to, to, to the context of Ukraine in terms of pre-conflict for many people that wouldn't be possible because so many people were um, you know come into the military in a situation of conflict so weren't necessarily going through that same same training um, but um, um, but, uh, uh, you know, just building on, on, on Avona's point, having these um, um, conversations about the possibilities, for example, of, of, of brain trauma um, as, as the conflict con continues is, is, you know, still important, you know, uh, throughout the conflict. Um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it there. OK, so we take another question from the what is lady in green. Okay. It's just coming. Hi, my name is Lily O'Neill. I'm a safeguarding conflict and gender sensitivity consultant. So I've got a question of two parts, which I hope you'll indulge me on. So the first part of my question refers to societal norms and the second is around the transferability of learnings. So the initial description of PTSD focused on the trauma of the individual. And I wondered whether you think there needs to be an additional layer of programming that focuses on the societal level in terms of stopping um, harmful private personal norms from translating to a society. Has that come across better? <laughs> I think if you can also speak up because there's a microphone in the room as well. So, okay. so just try shouting. So go back to question one. Yeah. We can hear. Uh, uh, yes, it's. Uh, I can hear. Um, that can prevent harmful personal social norms to break a society. And then the second part of my question refers to transferability of learnings from a context where this is primarily focused on military trauma rather than military. So I'm thinking particularly around climate-related conflicts or herd of bomb-related conflicts. Countries that is Somalia, South Sudan, they have facing where there's not these military structures. In the okay, so I think if we do the first question, is probably more to we'll start off with Avona, um, and this is around the the definition of PTSD and the extent to which the definition should uh, include a societal construct as well as a sort of personal diagnostic construct. I think the definition should be updated and it should include the societal context. However, I would um, urge to look a bit more broadly here and to involve that the fact that society is very complex at war and we see those very complex societal patterns happening in the country. Not all people are monogamously, uh, don't have a monogamous attitude towards what is happening. And there are a lot of different trajectories that might take. And so navigating those societal conflicts and societal traumas through all of their experiences without judgment is a very hard thing to do. And I think that there is not enough um, knowledge and not even enough conversation and um, talking happening in the country at the moment about what different personas do we have? What do those people go through? How, how do they build their relationships between each other to start building programming for the society at large? It's not only civilians and the military. Uh, once again, most of our military are civilians who were mobilized. Uh, and they have gotten to a very different culture. So we know a, a lot about how that transition happens, but we don't really know how it affects other people in their surrounding and, and, and many, many other things. So I would be very careful about it specifically during a war 
but looking forward to the future, I think that we should consider how society is, is affected through it as well. And then if I could take a second question and pose that to Heidi, because that was more about the transferability of observations from Ukraine into other conflicts areas, which absolutely lies with the EXCEPT programme. Yeah, if I might just mention one tiny thing on, on the previous question as well around um, the conversation taking a more societal approach, I think it is important when we talk about PTSD, when, when we talk about trauma more generally, is to, to, to consider collective trauma and also intergenerational trauma, and that that's, that that's spoken about and, and, and not ignored as well. Um, but just on the transfer, transferability of this, I, I think, um, um, so in terms of militant um, um, trauma and um, this, I think it's something that needs to be recognised a lot more. And that there are programmes that are, are working in, in this area and looking at the reasons why militancy takes place. I mean, why do young men join an armed group? It's not normally because they just want to be violent. It's because of the a lack of access to resources or um, a, a, a need to be able to protect their family or whatever. Um, so um, we need to be looking at the root causes of that. And uh, that often is... Oh, those root causes are often also interrelated with trauma and including conflict and collective trauma of, of, of society more generally. Now, in, within EXCEPT programme, if I think about one of the, the, the specific programmes that targeted men we were looking at in South Sudan, what was very important was these um, psychoeducation workshops with men who had been engaged um, in, for example, cattle, cattle raiding and Within the group work, they 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 talk about why it took place. They talk about guilt, um, and that, that those workshops were endorsed by the local population. So actually, they were kind of requested by particularly the um, um, some of the, the 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 leaders within the community, which is which is really important. So it's important that it's not imposed um, uh, um, purely for, for, from outside, but it's something that that uh, you know is endorsed um, locally. But I think it's really important to recognise the intersection of trauma um, um, with uh, and with violence, and 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 how this is the you know, can be part of a kind of re re reoccurrence of violence. And again, I don't want to go down the, the route of if you have traumatic experience, you're going to turn to violence. But we can't disconnect these completely. And so to engage militant, former militants, or the reintegration of former former uh, combatants, um, non-state armed combatants, is really, really important, I think, as part of the conversation. So can I pose, have we got any questions online? So I think Avona wants to come back in, yep. perhaps. Yeah. If I might comment as well on the point of transfer, transferability of knowledge, I think that um, today Ukraine starts producing a lot of data and there should be a lot of conversation about how whatever we're living through at the moment can actually benefit a larger community, if I do understand the uh, question correctly. But regardless, I want to make a point that I think what is underestimated by um, specifically civil society and mental health experts and generally people studying transition in, in um, other societies is the need to include Ukrainian experience in contingency planning. Uh, the experience of having a war in your own country and seeing how 20, 21st century uh, modern country is reacting as a society to an active war is, um, is a learning opportunity for everybody. There is a lot of things that we haven't expected as a, as a country, as a government, as a society happening within ourselves, and we don't know how to deal with them. Reaction of people to mobilization, to actually serving by duty uh, in a time of war, the reaction of families, the, um, the problems with the legislation that actually doesn't cover when people can be demobilized during martial law and how a martial law actually creates uh, injustice between two different groups of people. I know Messi doesn't like that word, but it's used here in, in the proper context. But I think that learning from those and starting to build contingency planning, just in case, as part of all those training programs, not only for how your military will react, but actually how your civil society will react, how your citizens will, will react to one or another um, event happening with the crisis that we're living in and with all the threats that, that are posed. And also looking at how Ukraine is actually, like, 
this, this, the fact, not only the mitigation, not only mitigating the, the poor consequence, but factually what is happening and how people are going through those traumatic experiences and adapting to living under fire constantly. It seems that Israel is a relevant experience, but no, again, it's, it's a very different context. It's a very different experience. It's a very different length of conflict and a different population. And I think that um, we would benefit a lot from scientific help to speed up our learning process in Ukraine on being able to describe those things in an internationally accepted professional language that could actually serve as, as knowledge for all of those colleagues studying those and developing policies for your own countries. Could I take another question from the lady in red? Yeah. And uh, if you translate uh, questions, I will be, uh, I will say thank you. Lady in red is always a good title. Um, <laughs> thank you. My name is Sophie Stevens. I work for SCDA and um, I'm responsible for overseeing our spending on EXCEPT as well, which is a um, really exciting program. So thank you to all the speakers. My question, I guess, is from the sort of government policy, international organisation perspective. Ivana, you touched on this in terms of the perceived and real challenges of kind of scale and cost around mental health interventions during or after a conflict. I have certainly heard in the past in my work in different places that, you know, it's too costly to fund large scale psychosocial support. And so there's then prioritization and different government agencies or international organizations say, well, we can't we can't do that fully. So we're not going to do it. You know, it'll only reach a small number of people. And there's obviously alternatives to that that have evolved over the years. And I think some of that relates to kind of culturally embedded understandings of, of mental health and having more research into that in different places. But if only you touched on some of the community led models that are more feasible at a low cost. And I was just interested in your comment on the most effective approaches. Do you think there's enough evidence around what works at scale to imp improve people's well-being in the short term or medium term? You also mentioned, you know, some of this is, is lifelong, people trying to rebuild their lives. But from a practical perspective, what would you recommend and where do you think the best evidence or the weakest evidence might be or others on the panel of what can be funded at scale in a realistic time frame? Because I think that kind of information is really vital. Thanks. So if you start off with Ivona and then Massey, if you've got um, any points to make. Uh, will we translate now or after I speak? Uh, Massey, come after you and we'll repeat that question um, okay. with translation. But if you come first, Ivona. OK, thank you so much. So um, first of all, I do think that personal psychosocial and psychological interventions are essential. But I think that what is lacking to specifically international programming that is implemented locally is the careful and thoughtful definition of criteria of eligibility. So everybody's eligible, most likely, and local partners are often looking for people who are out there and accessible, which turns in, in fact into the same people receiving multiple services and the people most in need not being reached out to and not being proactively engaged into those programs. And I think that that point should be emphasized a lot more carefully because we should consider this service as an elite in Ukrainian context at the moment. It is um, expensive. It is hard to access, not because there is no funding, but because there is no other resources as well. There are no people to provide it. There are no places to provide it. It is hard logistically. It, it, it gets complicated in all ways, but there are people who will benefit only from it and who actually desperately require it. The, the job of implementers and the job of program makers is to define those people and to define those eligibility criteria as more thoughtfully, in my opinion. However, we also want to be mindful that it doesn't create additional barriers. So, for example, in our programming, what we we do is we implement a case management model in which a case management the client and the therapist will check in every five sessions to ensure that the um, topic that they're working on is still um, related to the the cause of, of the beginning of the therapy so of course therapy and any other intervention can take ages but not all causes that will be talked about are actually considered um, combat related for example so for cost effectiveness you can create check-ins and um, more flexible approaches to continuation, but there also has to be a set eligibility criteria in the beginning. Regarding community efforts, I think that um, there has to be put more funding into the methodological development. So for example, we are running peer support groups and they are super 
um, well received. So we were we didn't expect it. We've had a thousand people and two thousand applicants in uh, one year only, and a thousand people actually participating in an online event. Mostly female, mostly spouses. Um, it's a specific dynamic of this particular audience, but. Um, the thing is that there are a lot of in, in initiatives like that around us, and there is a lot more capacity to do the, the, the same thing, I'm sorry, if there was knowledge and if there was methodology about how to scale it up on the local level, um, keeping in mind the ethical norms and the code of conduct and everything else. So usually those small organizations on the ground that we could reach out to and say scale this program, they don't have the baseline knowledge that we do like on the ethical standards on do the, the do no harm approaches and what it actually means this do no harm approach if taught that if it is written in plain language if it's delivered to them i think that there is a lot of potential to scale it up to very uh, different service providers when outranging the uh, simple like trained psychotherapists and psychologists and also on this, I want to uh, urge you to look at niche audiences. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but I want to urge you to look at niche audiences because, for example, after uh, 2014, uh, we've had an audience of veterans who actually got into prison after service. So they um, had some misconduct and they got into prison and they were served by other types of mental health service providers who are not part of the general mental health care system. And those people received no education at all about trauma informed care so they didn't actually know how to work with veterans and if a veteran got into psychi psychiatric or psychotherapeutic care while being in prison they wouldn't get trauma-informed care there which is paradoxical and it wasn't considered important because in fact those are a million uh, those were a thousand people or something like that it wasn't a large audience but i think it's important to look at such particular audience in in most need in most traumatic circumstances and address their particular issues with those programming and not overlook them while trying to make scale programs only so if i can just reframe the question so we can translate for for massey but the question is recognizing the limited uh, number of therapists what would be the best way to scale up mental health support for veterans скажіть будь ласка враховуючи обмежену кількість психотерапевтів який найкращий спосіб масштабувати психосоціальну підтримку та підтримку охорони в психічному здоров'ї Ну, я буду говорити українською і повільно щоб ви змогли перекладати правильно тоді треба робити паузи. Добре. Е, на мою особисту думку, бо я зараз можу говорити виключно через свій власний досвід, я вам розкажу таку штуку. Е, so my, my, my personal opinion, and I can only speak from my uh, own experience. Е, жоден психолог або психотерапевт не буде з тобою в найскладніший час вночі, коли ти сам вдома. Neither psychologist nor psychotherapist will be uh, with you in the most difficult times, for example, in the night when you are at home alone. Це значить, що в будь-якому разі ти можеш допомогти самому собі набагато краще, ніж будь-який спеціаліст, тому що в тяжкий час його не буде поруч. And that it means that uh, anyway, you yourself will be able to support yourself better than any specialist because you won't have the specialist in the, mo in the most hardest time. Тим паче, коли ви знаходитесь на лінії фронту, повертаєтесь, або коли ви знаходитесь вдома і ні дружина не знає, що з тобою насправді відбувається, ні брати, сестри і таке інше. Or if you are in the frontline setting, or if you are at home where the, your wife doesn't know, or your brothers and sisters, they don't know what's happening with you. На своєму власному досвіді я просвідчився, що мені достатньо насправді інформації про те, що зі мною відбувається. From my own experience, I understand that I have enough inf information about what's going on with me. Для того, щоб масштабувати і змогти більшій кількості людей допомогти, мені здається, це умовно кажучи, може бути тиждень, можливо, три дні лекцій про те, що з вами відбулось, і практичних порад, що з цим робити. 
I think uh, I have enough information to be able to scale it up, to scale my support and to cover more people um, than just myself. And I think it's enough to have um, one week or three days of lectures and practical advice to, to do that. Skeptics say that it doesn't work, and so давайте don't do anything. But I ask you that it's much easier and easier than anything to do, than to do anything, because it's obvious that there is a large number of great specialists or просто просто specialists ми не зможемо підготувати і дати суспільству. Um, the skeptics, skeptical people, people will say that you won't be able to do that. That's why let's not do it at all. At all. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, it's better to do this uh, rather than doing nothing, because uh, anyway we won't be able to uh, prepare and train the la that large amount of specialists that we need. А, ну і резюмуючи, ще одна історія це для того, щоб масштабувати. Ну я думаю, що зараз, поки ветерани ще військові, вірніше, не демобілізувались, вже зараз можна готувати родини знову ж таки тим самим інформуванням, що найменше цього буде ну як мінімум непогано це мати, тому що зараз немає взагалі нічого з цим. And uh, one more point uh, regarding scaling up. Um, while our military, uh, while our troops are fighting uh, on the front line, I think we can at least uh, give give some information to the families to prepare them for the return or their of their loved ones. Because right now they it would it would be, be uh, better than it is now because right now they don't have anything. So thank you very much for your comments as well, Massey. And I'm afraid we've uh, we've run out of time. Um, I think that uh, this has been a very rich um, and deep discussion uh, around the mental health consequences of war. And I'd particularly like to thank Massey and Ivona for bringing to life for us um, the lived reality of what that feels like for the Ukrainian population and how you are already trying to um, influence the provision of services for um, the combatant who has experienced those mental health consequences of war, which they will be living with, with the for the rest of their lives and their families will be living with for, for the rest of their lives. I'd particularly like to thank Heidi for putting this conversation into a wider context and linking it to uh, other dimensions of, of the ACCEPT programme. And from my own personal uh, sort of reflections and experience, Pretty much every single one of these topics were topics that came up in sort of 2004, 2005, as we started to see the casualties from Iraq and Afghanistan coming back into the UK and, uh, and challenging the nation in terms of how did we respond to their needs and recognise that their experience was unique and that um, as a society we needed to work out how to provide um, you know, both physical and uh, mental health support to veterans whose experience was totally different from a civilian experience. I think the big difference uh, that comes across today is the fact that unfortunately the, the war in Ukraine doesn't show any signs of diminishing and that as a society they are facing, you know, a long war, a campaign, and therefore they're having to uh, address these issues without a resolution from the war, then they have no control, they can't turn it off. Um, there are clearly some transferable lessons that need to come back into wider Western societies about what might the nature of a potential more intense conflict in Europe look like and how do we build resilience in our society so that we have the ability to fight for our values if we needed to. So I think this has been a a really uh, thought-provoking and challenging um, session. And again, I'd just like to say thank you again to Massey, Ivona and Heidi for their contributions. Um, thanks to the Accept uh, Consortium for uh, being able to host this environment. Thank you to the IT team for 
um, providing, I hope, a seamless experience for everybody who's joined us online. Uh, and then finally, there's a small drinks reception um, for those of you who've got time to stay and network uh, amongst everybody who's here. And is there anything I've left out? That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.